we have a wonderful guest today, Leslie Kober. Um, before we get started, before we start the conversation, I'm just going to mention to our audience and our, our viewers that this event is produced by Visual Arts Passage. It's a free event. <laughs> so uh, please do us a favor and give us a like. Uh, that's a that's a, a fair exchange, I think. So, um, Leslie, uh, thank you for being here. I'm going to read what I pulled off your website. And this was this is perfect. And I wish that every artist did this for me. <laughs> Go to your website and there's this, you know, it's a synopsis of, of the bio and it's exactly what you want to talk about. It's what you want to, to say about yourself. And it's just really well said. Leslie Kober is president of the Society of Illustrators in New York, professor of illustration at the Fashion Institute of Technology and Western Connecticut State University and is an illustrator with work scaling across global publications and Fortune 100 companies. Very well said, very succinct, and all of that is true. <laughs> thank <laughs> so, you. And it's um, to be here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to, I got some, some great artwork to look at. Uh, we're going to get into conversations. I know we're going to, you know, uh, you and I have a lot in common. Uh, we have fathers that were friends, and I've known of you. Um, I, very strange. I, I, I didn't meet you in person in 2020, um, but I've known of you, and obviously when you be, after you were a professional, I was very aware of you, but I knew of you. I knew you were interested in being an illustrator when I was trying to learn how to be an illustrator, <laughs> and so we have a lot of a lot of similarities there and and then kind of different directions also so um i'm going to kind of click through and look at some artwork and as i i can't you got to start it if you got an opportunity to start a presentation with dog smoking and drinking <laughs> wine, uh uh it, i mean that's perfect right um who'd you do this for leslie um well i i had a bunch of columns at one point and the previous one was from Microsoft with the hearts. And this one was for a magazine called Incentive, which was a business um, magazine. And I actually, both of those um, had columns that went on for years that every month um, I created an illustration for the same column with the same author on it. So it was really fun, as you can see, like every like month, it was some like really conceptual illustration that I could do for. Well, your, your, your drawing approach, uh, voice as an artist is perfect <laughs> for the subject matter. I love it. Uh, uh, absolutely love it. Um, we, I mean, we have, we have a lot, a lot to look at and a lot to talk about. Yeah. Um, you, you currently, uh, you live on the East Coast. Where exactly do you live? So I live in Stamford, Connecticut. I've lived in Connecticut for the last 30 years or so. I just moved to Stamford, Connecticut five years ago. Um, I live at the water here and I love it. it. It's close to the city. It's about 50 minutes into New York City and I can walk to the train, which is really great. So um, I love Connecticut. I grew up in Westchester, which is only a half an hour away. So my mother's in Westchester, my brother's in Westchester. Um, and so I'm in Stanford, Connecticut. So um, how often do you go into the city? Well, I go in pretty often. I mean, especially when I'm teaching, I'm going in this evening. There's a there's an opening reception and a happy hour at the Society of Illustrators tonight. So um, I have plans to go in um, this evening. Um, I This time of year when I'm not teaching, I have a little break um, for the month of December and part of January. So I don't go in as much, but um, in a regular time, I go in about three days a week. Um the uh you teach at two different schools um are you are you still doing that now yeah i do i mean i teach at um fit um the fashion institute of technology i've been there going on 18 years now and i teach graduate students in illustration um and in an undergraduate class at western connecticut state university which is in um danbury connecticut oh wow um i did I, I, that was my next question i didn't know where western uh, Connecticut State University was. Um, yeah, they have this beautiful um, 
building. Actually, they brought me in to teach the MFA students. It's been 10 years since I've been there and they had just built this incredible building. The governor of Connecticut had gone to a uh, state school in Connecticut and she had this major goal to create this art um, like building in Connecticut. And I went to the ribbon cutting for it. And um, I came in just as they built this incredibly like modern, contemporary, beautiful um, art school there. Wow, good timing. <laughs> it, 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 it unusual that I mean it, well it's great that part of the world you have so many opportunities there's so many schools close by um especially in the city um so um you did your undergraduate at Syracuse correct yeah I did my undergraduate school at Syracuse University and actually Murray Tinkleman was my chairman um, there, I was looking, I had gotten into a whole bunch of art schools, great art schools. And at that point in my life, I was really looking to be in a university setting. Um, there, a lot of the art schools then didn't have full degrees of all the academics. And um, I wanted to have that full range. So Syracuse was the best school for me. And so I went to Syracuse University under Murray um, for undergraduate. And then um, for graduate school, I went to the University of Hartford Art School, which was also Murray, was my chairman um, there as well. Yeah, that was that was Murray's program. And yeah. uh, when Murray passed, uh, Chris took it over, Chris Payne. Yeah. Um, yes. um, so th this next slide is really important. <laughs> This is, uh, uh, as uh, and I've been kind of holding off. I didn't, you know, yeah. your, your, your father, Alan Cober, I mean, he was a hero of mine. Um, somebody I was very fortunate to to meet uh, as a teenager and spend a little bit of time with at the illustrator, several illustrators workshops, uh, had my portfolio <laughs> reviewed by him. Um, and um, uh, my, yeah. my knees were still shaking. <laughs> I, I can talk about this a little bit because, um, you know, I was just a few years old when I created this illustration and it was really important, you know, growing up with a father who was a successful illustrator, um, we had a lot of great materials around and actually in his studio, he had a certain area for me and my brother um, with materials for us. But um, this is created with a Croquil dip pen um, the same pen my father used, a 102 point Crocal pen with India ink. So at a very, very young age, I was already drawing with pen and ink um, where my friends or little kids were drawing with crayons. Um, I was drawing with professional tools. I mean, there's pieces, this looks like it was in a sketchbook because my father also make made sure that <laughs> I drew in sketchbooks. <laughs> and I have a lot of sketchbooks when I was only a few years old. I must have just pulled it out of the sketchbook. But you'll notice, too, that I signed it because my father, like, said that it was really important to sign your artwork. And he dated his artwork. So I dated the artwork as well. Um, and another big point of it was that my father really um, encouraged me to draw from life. He thought things should be drawn from life. So he would pose for me. Um, I have a lot of drawings of different relatives and my brother um, posing for me, but this is my father sitting in front of me and me drawing with a croquil pen at a very, it's, very young age. <laughs> it's terrific. And I, I'm guessing, I'm looking at the 72, so I'm guessing you're seven or eight years old. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't know many, many seven or eight year olds that can get likeness. And uh, <laughs> you nailed the likeness. <laughs> I mean, it looks, too, I would know that, I would know that was your father. If it was yeah, just out of the blue. <laughs> that's what people talk. I actually um, posted it a few years ago on his birthday, just as a memorial, um, uh -huh. like a happy memorial, just to look. And people were like kind of blown away by like the energy of him that I actually um, got. But he taught me how to see things at a very young age, you know, how to look, how to look on my paper to go back and forth. And um, I understood that um, at a very young age uh, that a lot of my friends were like, I mean, a kind of a funny story with my father is like, a lot of my friends would draw, join these bodies that were like these X bodies. 
And you know, when you're a kid too, you want to do what your friends are doing as well. So I started drawing art with people with these X bodies. And my father was like, no X bodies. <laughs> <laughs> he like put it, that was like my father didn't put his foot down with me with many things at all but when it came with the x bodies he's like <laughs> when it came to drawing he got serious right <laughs> okay so I, I i do have to point out a couple of things and you and i have spoken a lot off camera and and on camera too about this but um your father uh and you and your father had a really great relationship and he was very nurturing um, you talked about being insulated, <laughs> um, and um, that's not how I knew your father. <laughs> your father was an intimidating soul um, with artists. I mean, he he had uh, he did uh, portfolio reviews, and he was complete. He was very direct. Um, he wasn't an ass about it. Um, he was just very very direct and honest. And uh, he would not sugarcoat things. Um, so I remember, <laughs> I remember having to show him work that I did for the illustrators workshop when I was uh, 18 years old, 19 years old. And everybody else, and, and the other thing is too, I didn't know Peak. I knew Peak the less. I didn't know Bob Peak. I didn't know him as well. I knew your father a little bit. He, I, I saw him at uh, social. Uh, he would come to our house or the Atnes's house or the Heindel's house where I would be the kid. All the kids would be there and stuff like that. And and so I, I had conversations with him and um, and he was always extremely nice. But it was like totally different when I had to present my work to him uh, because everybody was shaking at the, shaking in their boots. And you got to choose um, or I don't know if you got to choose or they chose for you who was going to review your work for certain assignments. And, and it's like, it was like getting a draft notice. <laughs> it's like, I got Alan Cober. <laughs> and and I, I knew Bernie and I knew Bob and um, or Bob Heindel and Fred Otnes extremely well. And um, they, they approached it differently. Your father was the first serious portfolio review I ever had. Um, and it, and it, I still remember to this day uh, just being really nervous about it and how direct he was. And I'm sure he he curbed it for me. <laughs> I'm sure he was very light and I wasn't very good. So it was it was, you know, prob probably pretty easy for him at the time. But um, you again, we, we you know, we we have talked about the relationships that we have with our father, you know, mm -hmm. uh, being growing up around um the aesthetics that are around our household. Uh, it was all art. It was all about art. Um, we didn't have, you know, there wasn't a People magazine in our house. There, it, you know, we had uh, graphics. <laughs> we had uh, communication arts. Uh, you had uh, uh, books on artists just like strewn through our, our house. And that's what, you know, that's what was presented. And if you were interested, you picked them up and you looked at them. And, and I acquired a lot of information, not even knowing that I acquired it and building aesthetic. You started drawing. I didn't start drawing till I was uh, uh, till after I was 16 years old. And you started drawing like as an infant, it seems like. <laughs> um, tell me about that. All, yeah, I mean, that's all I wanted to do. Um, we would, in the summers, we would go to Cape Cod and because my father, um, was an illustrator, we were able to go to Cape Cod and rent a home at the beach. And he would work on his assignments, like in these rental houses that we had, like right in the kitchen, he'd be like working on um, major assignments and things. And um, it was, um, you know, he, it was, the art was like around all the time. And that, that was really our life. And, you know, as a young kid, you, you only know what you know. And, you know, that was like normalcy for me of having the art around. But when everyone would go to the beach and we would go away with different families, um, I wanted to leave the beach. I wasn't really a beach person. And I would go back to the, um, the house we were renting and I would just draw in the house, mostly princesses and crowns <laughs> and things. And I, I would actually like hang them up, like tape them to the wall and things. So I always loved drawing. Um, I talk about that when I was in first grade, when the teacher asked everybody in the class what they wanted to 
be when they grow up. I said an illustrator, not even an artist, <laughs> but I was going to be an illustrator. So I knew at a very young age <laughs> and followed that path. There were there are times I wanted to be an astronaut for a little while. <laughs> I thought about being a surgeon because I, I really loved like science and biology and dissecting and things. But I think, you know, when I speak to surgeons, very often surgeons are very creative as well. So I thought like, well, maybe I could be a surgeon, but it was really an illustrator that I always wanted to be. But we were talking about, you know, style and, you know, seeing what your father does or your mother or whoever's the creative person in the household. This is all I knew. It's I wasn't creating a style. I was just kind of being me. And it was just being influenced by anyone when you're in a household and they talk about like nurture and nature. I mean, around me these were the supplies that were around and I was using pens and I was never thinking oh when I grow up I want to draw like this or I want to do like this I was really just being me I was creating things um, that were natural to me and I was really never thinking about um, inspiration there were definitely people's work that I really loved it was usually um, pen and ink work and it was unusual artwork um, that I loved. I mean, really, as a teenager, I loved Brad Holland's work. Um, I got a chance, you know, when you're talking about the illustrators workshop, um, that was one of the luncheons that I really wanted to go to because I knew Brad Holland, he was speaking that day, and I wanted to see his work. But I liked unusual work. And, you know, my father was the, um, the curator, um, the chairman of the um, of artists during the Vietnam War, there was a show at the Society of Illustrators. And there was a pin um, that I was given that was this ink mouse um, that was drawn and the tail came around from the mouse and it kind of shot the mouse. Um, there was like a little blood. It was just, it was black and red, but it was all black line on a white pin with a little blood where it came around. And I cherished that pen. I like loved it at such a young age. It was such a weird kind of conceptual. Mm. I loved that pen. And I didn't realize till I was a young, I don't know, maybe like 15 years ago that that pen was created by Brad Holland so many years ago, probably when he was just beginning. So I was just drawn to this kind of work. And this piece that you're showing right now, this was for a show um, that was in um, New York City. It was called Memento Mori. And um, it, I created this kind of as an homage to my father in a way. It was my artwork, but I actually took a portrait of my father that he had created um, for a piece of his art. And I just cut it out as collage and put it in because Memento Mori is after death. And, you know, my father was really a, my biggest inspiration in life, not only for the art, but just a way of being. And, you know, you talk about, you know, how intimidating um, he was. This like kind of like a mix because I think he was really serious about artists and quality of art. But on the other hand, you know, I talked to like Anita Coons always says to me, she says, yeah. your father was a match. And which means like, you know, my father had this really loving heart on the other side too. And for people who, um, you know, looked for his inspiration and who he helped out when they were first starting, he was really passionate about it. And actually Gary Kelly, we were talking about Gary Kelly earlier on, I remember when Gary Kelly was first starting and he came to my home and my father picked him up at the train station. Um, mm. And I just remember him as a young man, like I was really young and he was sitting in um, my living room. And my father, when someone was really talented, my father really took them in and really, um, wanted to kind of help them and mentor them. And I realized that was really his biggest legacy to me, um, you know, as when I realized after he passed away. That's a, that's a really interesting thing. I got a couple of things I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. wanting to, I don't want to interrupt you, but I keep thinking of things that come to mind. First of all, um, 
I know your father was a collector of uh, toys, of uh, like primitive toys. Yes. That, and um, the aesthetic around that. I mean, I I can see that as part of you. I mean, I can see the aesthetic that was your your father's aesthetic that you know is, um, that was your world. And uh, and I and I and uh, and and uh, what great what great things to be looking at. I will say um, differently. I just kind of a take on. Uh, this relationship and how you talk about your father. My father, I, I, I didn't, um, I didn't have any desire to be an artist up until I was like 16 because it looked like he worked all the time. And I didn't realize how much fun he was having <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and how much he enjoyed it, but he worked all the time. And, um, I, and again, I, it's like, that was the last thing you're talking about, thinking about what you wanted to be as a child. And uh, Troy Heindel and I were talking about this. It's like, okay, well, we're either going to be a professional football player, a boxer, or we're going to race motorcycles. <laughs> it's all the dumb stuff we were doing in our backyard. Um, and it, you you obviously had a, a, a little bit more cultured <laughs> approach to it. <laughs> Troy, and I were try Troy and I were battling who, uh, who went to the hospital most. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, my parents, there were a lot of, um, you know, he collected toys as my mother, you know, my mother was an influence at all as, um, as well. I mean, she was really my fashion influence and, you know, interior kind of design and, and things. And I baked and cooked a lot with my mother who had a, des a great design sense, but my father, his collections of toys, folk art, um, I loved all of that. And, you know, some people go the opposite direction uh, because they like, they don't like like how they grew up with it. But I loved all of that. And I would have sleepovers at my house and we would all sleep in sleeping bags in the living room amongst all the folk art and the toys. And my friends would joke with me. And those were the days when the Adams family was on television. <laughs> And they would call my house the Adams family. <laughs> and I didn't even realize that it was odd. That's funny. It was, like, it was like normalcy to me. And it was interesting to me. And I loved all of that. That's that, what I re, I'm going to re also respond to. One of the few things that, that I wanted to respond to you and not interrupt you with. But this is the fact that your father nurtured so many people. That was a, that was a characteristic of my father, too. And um, And I, you know, him being... Uh, you know, difficult with portfolios or whatever you want to call it, or just intimidating. Um, but he had great information, and it, it, you know, you, you, I've had that conversation with Anita Kuntz about your father, and Anita said you know, one of her favorite things that uh, was ever said to her is that, and she said, I almost took it, I didn't know to take it at a comp as a compliment when he said it to me, but she says, it, it, the the quote was you can make all these silly ideas. You take all these silly ideas and just make great pictures out of them. <laughs> and it was just something that she just loved him saying that about her work. He had a great sense of humor. So, you know, a lot of his work where someone who doesn't know him thinks it comes across as scary. Um, you know, even when it's like a portrait that he's done of himself with all kinds of skull dance around and and things he that was like funny to him I mean we had collections of skulls in my house did I know that was odd no <laughs> not at all I mean these pieces that you're showing right now these are really like my sketchbook I'm left-handed and I always had problems with sketchbooks being a left-handed person so I started just creating like my thoughts on um, these are like little Strathmore trading cards. So I have about 400 of these. They're just like little, they're quotes I love because I love typography as well. I love writing and handwriting and just like little quotes of things that are happening in my life. It's really like a diary of my life, these cards, just things that are happening um, when I go on vacations, drawing things, on it. So all kinds of, um, that's what these little cards are all about. They're really my sketchbook. 
That's great. I I draw on loose paper all the time. Um, it, it, you know, I know there's artists that are just preach the sketchbook. And my father was the opposite. He preached. He said, I, the sketchbook's useless to me. He said, because everything I draw ends up on my drawing board. You know, I, have it pinned to, I have it pinned to my drawing board and I'm using it all the time. And so I want it to be flexible. So he drew on loose paper all the time. Uh, he drew on a, I, I, I have one right here. I have one. It's uh, uh, um, just a clipboard and um, draw, and, you know, just put a piece of paper on a clipboard and carry it around. Uh, you don't have the binding issue. Um, and then you can pin it up. Um, I do. I, I also find it really fascinating um, that you knew what you wanted to do at such a young age. Um, uh, you know, that's and and you stuck to it. And you know, obviously, time well spent. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I just I I don't know when you became uh, it really meant something to me. Um, and we're going to talk about this, you know, we don't have to talk about our fathers the whole time, but this thing I really want to talk about, and we've touched upon it a couple of times. When you became the society, the president of the Society of Illustrators, I was just like, I got this huge smile. And yeah. it's like, there was, I don't, and this is not belittling anybody that's working now or worked before or whatever, but there was something about those six guys uh, and they, they again they were all men uh at the at the illustrators workshop and there's so many more it's so many great women illustrators now and um but these six people carried themselves in a way that you know it's like you were talking about the fashion sense you got from your mother well your father and fred and bernie and my father they were all paying attention to fashion they were all they 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 spent fortunes on wardrobes. You know, they 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 um, they carried themselves in a way that was really unique. And I remember I remember that very well. I, I wear jeans and T-shirts most of the time. And, and, and my father did a lot, too. But he also was they were they had formal parties. You know, they had formal events. Um, they were involved with uh pop cult and they they you know their work went so many places they were a part of pop culture you know there's it it was just an unusual thing and it was like and i have to bring it up it was kind of a they were kind of like a resurgent of illustrators illustrators that approached in a different way that were extremely creative that opened up the door for so many other illustrators and um you said some things to me the other day off camera that really made me think about, you know, how much they were paying attention to what was going on around them. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, I, I thought of my father, he, he was an artist, but I thought of him as a businessman. And, and I think these guys really thought the business side of what being an artist is. And I was taught at a young age too, representing. And I, I get really passionate about things. I mean, I'm very passionate, obviously, about illustration and the illustration community and the society of illustrators and things. And I try to represent like what it is well. And I think those guys were representing who they are. It, they dressed in a certain way. They presented themselves in a certain way. Um, it was the time also of like the Mad Men um, generation of on television, like what was going on too on it. But I think representing as I thought of him, my father is a businessman. And yeah. I really think of illustration as a business and, you know, teaching in the schools. And at sometimes I have almost 100 students at a time in a semester one of the things I talk to them about is you're really the CEO of your own company. It's you and you represent who you are when you walk in a room. And I think they understood that it wasn't only about their art. It was a way of presenting themselves. Um, there was a package um, yeah. to it. And they, I were, think they were a brand. Um, it's a brand. And we, we talk about now, you know, a lot, of, especially with social media, I mean, social media is really about your brand and your marketing and being unique. And I'm actually a big 
component of being unique. I mean, I, my students all the time are asking me, you know, how do you create a style? What do you do with a style? And, and, you know, I was talking about it with myself a little bit too. It's when I was growing up, I liked other people's work, but I wasn't looking to other people for what I wanted to create. I was kind of just doing my thing. And I feel that style and who you are is really, it just comes out of you on it. And I think that's the best thing you can be um, also um, as an illustrator. And I think that's what those guys were doing. They were just being themselves. They were presenting themselves in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I think people were responding to that. Um, yeah, they, had, they had such great venue. Um, people, I mean, the the print, print was in prime form. Um, uh, very creative print at the time was in prime form. And, you know, I just look at, I, you know, after my father passed away, I have a lot of his, I have a lot of his original work, but I have so many things that catalogs, things that were printed, things that were printed about him. And, you know, you know, it's, it, in it, you know, it's like his, you know, Mohawk paper did this, like this portfolio and it, you know, it doesn't say Mohawk paper on the front. It says Mark English, <laughs> you know, and that, that's a, that's how they treated those people. Yeah. Well, I did a few things for um, paper companies as well. Those are the best assignments because paper and actually, you know, I have my cover for Strathmore paper, um, which is, you know, working for paper companies is the best because they want it to be printed beautifully. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when we get assignments for that and they want to give us credit also on it. So paper companies are the best to work for, for sure. Um, and the pieces that you're like kind of showing right now, this is, you know, as an artist, I'm always trying to experiment in a bit. Everything you can tell is always my work. But I was creating a series. I was asked to create a solo show in um, a gallery, um, the RPAC Gallery in Ridgefield, Connecticut. And it was their inaugural like opening. Um, and they asked me to create a show. And I knew for um, over a decade, I was actually collecting um, designer boxes. And I knew I wanted to do something with these boxes but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do art wise. And when I was asked to create the show, I proposed this idea that I wanted to take all of these designer boxes and use them as my canvases instead of using like typical paper and things, which I always thought was so important, but I, I wanted to use um, these boxes. So I created a whole series called um, Thinking Out of the Box. And it was all about using um, designer boxes, designer bags as my canvases on it. Yeah, they're they're beautiful, very well done. Um, other other than your father, and I know you mentioned Murray Tinkleman's name. What other uh, interaction you at, at either at Syracuse or the MFA program? I mean, who? What other illustrators were you like influenced by or? learned from or had you know consider part of your uh, uh well i mean I, I mentioned you know brad holland who i loved and in those days i really looked up to vivian flesher um wow. vivian flesher was just she was a little older than me and she actually spoke at the illustrators workshop and while i was looking to her she was like a young woman who was just starting out and was really successful. And I looked to her and I actually remember her talk there because I went to hear her talk and she had created um, on her own, she said she wanted to work for Jell-O. <laughs> and it's funny, but this was so resonated in my mind as like a young woman. And she said, I wanted to do a project for Jell-O and I actually created all these art pieces that looked like something they would use. And I actually, and then she got like an assignment from them. And that's really how, like, I looked to that. And that's what I thought of when I was first starting out on it. Because I think as young up and coming illustrators, we have our goals in our life. And really one of my goals was 
I wanted to create a piece of art for the New York Times Magazine Sunday section because in those days that was a really big thing in my house and like the Sunday magazine section you'd sit down and you'd look at and they called me one day and that was like the ultimate like that piece of artwork actually is framed next to my drawing table because that meant so much to me. So I think as like young illustrators are starting out, there's certain um, people that you look to. And ironically, I know the Norman Rockwell Museum, um, Stephanie Plunkett has this um, show of Leo Leone um, right now, which I haven't gotten um, to see yet, but there was a book by Leo Leone where, where I was a tiny kid and I used to read the book and it was called Frederick. Um, I don't know if that piece, any of the work from that book is in the show, but if anyone knows that book, Frederick, I read that book as a little kid, just like when you see the book that I have, I've got like Leslie is like written with like words, like letters backwards and things. Mm -hmm. um, but Frederick, he, um, the, at the end, he, um, he tells all well, the mice that he was a poet and all the mice actually were collecting and working all year long for the winter, but he was drawing pictures and at the very end, they're like angry at him because they were working so hard. They're like, Frederick, what were you doing? And he gives them this whole like speech about um, with paintings that he did of rainbows and things. And he actually got them through the winter with his artwork. And I actually, Leo Leone in that book, I already was identifying with that at such a young age that that was really who I was. I wasn't the collector of the stuff. I was the one who was drawing the picture to make everything better. <laughs> That's terrific. The um, uh, Something else your, your father did, I remember um, hearing this from a number of the other illustrator workshop teachers, I guess is what you call them, or uh, uh, participants. Uh, but um, your father, different than the other group he was the first one and and i remember my dad being very succinct about this and being really excited that alan would go out and create his own projects and he would do personal projects he would create projects and then go out and sell them and he said he was very much an entrepreneur mm -hmm. And he said he had, he had never he had never even considered doing anything like that. You know, he had an agent that got him all the work and he was doing all the magazine work and, you know, very successful from that. And he never thought about like controlling, uh, like like th that, that having the control like your father did. And I think that's a something very um, uh, it was it was kind of groundbreaking. Uh, not only was his work, but the way he, that he approached it. And um, so another kudo to your father. <laughs> Thank well, you. Know, we, as illustrators, we were really entrepreneurs. And I don't even like the word freelance. Like we are, we're entrepreneurs. We, we are the head of our own companies. We represent our own companies. We find our own work. And I think now more than ever, illustrators are looking for their own projects yeah, um, absolutely. For things. But that was really unusual um, back then. And he had a great um, he had a great collaboration with um, the Rolling Stone magazine, Fred Woodward. They had known each other for years um, before um, Fred was at Rolling Stone. He was at Texas Monthly. And I had created work for Texas Monthly for Fred as well. But when Fred went to Rolling Stone magazine, my father um, would collaborate with ideas. And that's when my father created the, um, it's kind of a, a great assignment that he had done about the Pope and touring the United States with the Pope, like it was a concert. And um, that he created, he had the idea and Fred agreed to it. And that's why Fred was, you know, such a legend in what he did as an art director, because he believed in the illustrators, he hired the right people and he let illustrators really do their thing. 
um, and because he was confident in the people that he had hired to do things. So yes, my father would go out and create his own assignments um, very often. Yeah, and which is, as you said, you know, people that are doing crowdsourcing or however they're doing it, promoting their own work now uh, with creating their own projects. That was very unusual uh, at that time. Uh, right. And I remember my my father making a real point of me to pay attention to it. Um, the a um, couple of other things that uh, I have to ask. I mean, you you you, uh, you have children. Yes, I have two children. I have a son who's almost 30, who um, is doing really well in um, marketing and branding company he works for. And then I have a daughter who's in her last semester of law school right now um, out in LA. They're both really creative, um, great designers, great artists. And um, they've chosen to go into other parts of it. I mean, my daughter, even as a lawyer, she wants to go into entertainment law and work with, she had an internship with Marvel, um, Marvel movies, and she's very creative. And I think one thing, one reason she's doing really well going into this is because they love that she understands art and the sensibilities to that. And then my son, he's a great designer and has great unique ideas. So I'm really proud of both of them. <laughs> awesome. So raising a family when you were doing career, were you teaching at the same time? Um, um, you know, I was doing my freelance work for a long time first. And then when my daughter um, was born, I would say when she was probably in first or second grade, I started teaching um, just at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Um, I just started with one class there. I had always thought about teaching. Um, I collected all of my um, manuscripts and sketches and kept them for so long. And I knew that I wanted to teach one day. Um, I was like alone in my studio for a long time. And I remember even when I was going into illustration, my parents were concerned that I would be alone in a studio um, all the time alone, um, kind of talking to myself. <laughs> so uh, when I had a chance to teach, I really wanted to get out and um, teach students. And that's when I started. Um, she, she was young. But I, I didn't go into that till she was like a little older. So um, I wasn't around, I was around a little less. Um, brings up another topic, one that, that I think came very natural to you about being comfortable being alone in your studio. I, on the other hand, uh, one of the more difficult things, I just, I, I, I had this long discussion about this. I've had a number of times with him with Sterling Hunley and Sterling went to a, uh, um, a university like I did it was not an art school and uh there's a lot going on <laughs> at, a, at a university at a, a liberal arts program um and one of the most difficult things is to teach myself to be alone uh for long periods of time now I cherish it and it's like when I tell my wife all the time is I just want to make the noise to stop and me to go back in my you know studio and turn the music on and disappear um which is wonderful um when I was raising kids you know when our, my children were young um I would go to work at 1 a.m or 2 a.m and then sleep during the day when my kids were at school my response to me my wife worked at uh, it was a designer at Hallmark Cards, and I had to pick our kids up from school. and 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 my time with them was uh, till bedtime. Um, she dealt with the morning stuff, and uh, mm -hmm. and it was it was an interesting. I did that for fifteen years. Um, I it, I, th I find it, you know, some of the things that you've said, you know, talking about this, you being an entrepreneur, or looking at a, a contemporary illustrator as a, a, owning their own business, it's so true. And I, you know, educationally, you know, we, I've seen so many people that go, went from the Illustration Academy to, you know, what we're doing online with Visual Arts Passage now and the success stories and, and failures of people that go through those programs. And the one consistency of success is someone that's willing to take care of all aspects, um, to organize their life 
wrapped around their art. You know, the art first, but you got to take care of everything. You know, I, I personally had a good friend, uh, a very good artist that failed miserably. Um, one of the big problems he had, he didn't realize he had to pay his taxes. And, <laughs> and um, I mean, he went for like seven or eight years without paying his taxes. And, and he was done when that was over with. He couldn't be an artist. Wow. And it's like, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, being an artist is an interesting thing because, you know, someone was like talking to me about like narcissism and like with artists and things, you know, it's, it's hard because there's a lot of things I love um, uh, that I love to do. And sometimes I almost feel like there's almost too many things I'd love to do because you could love a lot of things and still need to control the amount of things um, that you do. But when you're an artist, you love creating your work. And, you know, it's balance, I've realized is a really, you know, as you get older, I, when I first started, it was all about my work. And I didn't take a lot of breaks. I, you know, someone would call to want to have lunch or go out. And I, I didn't want to leave. I, I had deadlines. And I would really stay around my studio and sometimes not leave where I was for like a week at a time because I had a gym and I, you know, I didn't need to like leave. And then I started realizing there's definitely an important aspect of going out. And I think I started realizing that more when I took the teaching position. And I realized how social I really am as a person. And no doubt there's sometimes I just want to be in my studio and just be in the moment of my artwork. But it's really important to have that uh, those other sides of your life and be able to balance all of these things. And there's no way to be an expert. You can't do everything. Anyone who says you can, you can be everything. I mean, there's a give and take on things when you create the balance. But I think balance is really important um, in the long run to it. I think artists very often want to just be working on their art and it's hard to balance all the things, but balance is a really good thing. <laughs> no, you, you know, again, I'm going to, uh, this is one of the questions I had written down to you. What, what are like, have been the benefits from you from teaching? Well, first of all, I love my students and the benefits is what you gain from the students as well. Um, I even became more confident in myself of just, you know, walking into a room and sharing my knowledge and, you know, the, the back and forth um, with the students. Um, you think that, you know, you're coming in there with your knowledge and you're showing them that, but they're also teaching you um, a certain things about life and about art and the research that you need to do when you're teaching and to, it just makes you a better person um, as a whole. So. Makes you make you a better artist too. <laughs> and it makes you a better artist. It makes you a better person. And that's part of balance as well too, is getting out. And there's nothing better than giving back when you've had the knowledge of something and to teach the next generation. And I can get, I just gonna give like just a tiny story, but you know, this summer um, I wrote a course for FIT, a pre-college course on um, portfolios, um, helping high school students put portfolios together um, to get into colleges. And it was a bunch of Saturdays. <laughs> And I know none of us likes to really work on a Saturday. And I was really cutting, you know, every day I, I'd wake up on Sunday. I'd be like, oh, no, it's Sunday. <laughs> um, but at the last minute of the last class, one of the um, young women in the class gave me a piece of paper. And she said, you don't have to look at it now when you get a chance. I just wrote you a little note. I want you to see it. And I was like, okay, and thank you so much. And she went on her way. And when I got down to my office, I opened it up and it, it was all about how she was questioning herself and her artwork and she didn't know what to do. And, you know, being with me and spending the time on these Saturdays, how now she was confident and she was going to move on and this was going to be her major. 
and it was just so beautiful and it like this little things like that you read it and you're like this is like this is what it's all about and the importance of it so I actually put it up next to my table in my office and I'm that's always cool. like reading it just because it's important that's cool yeah it's like again <laughs> the program I sold, this piece I sold to actually one of my high school friends like bought this who really? like it's so in the bunny man um she, um lips like sugar and um she has this in her home that's and, great uh, but this is like a Prada box I had taken a big Prada box and um I created this art I had a show um at this music venue um that I'm on the board of and um she ended up buying it for her home so um I mean I think that's fun I, because of social media I've reconnected with so many people you know through my art you know, seeing things, you know, people have reached out to me, but hey, do you remember we went to high school together? We went to, you know, uh, we were in grade school together. I mean, all kinds of fun things like that have happened. Um, I, I was going to ask this question about, uh, again, that's, and again, I, 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 trying to say this without insulting anybody, because we have lots and lots of great students that come through our programs, and every school has, you know, they have suits you you when you see a student that you know is serious about what they want to do they know they want to be a professional they want to do what you're doing and to be able to help somebody like that it it it, it is my greatest benefit of anything that i do um at, professionally i'm better than making a great piece of art and my 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 father told me this uh um how much he thought about teaching and then how much he, you know, he would pull back and say, I can't do, I'm being pulled in so many different places. He goes, I can't teach that much, but I can be impactful with what I'm doing. That's why he loved the, the you know, mm -hmm. what you're doing with the Academy. Um, when he died, that was the thing that just blew me away was I'm not kidding you. There were thousands of people that reached out, not tens of thousands, but there was over a thousand people that reached out to me. And most of them said, he is the, he is the reason I wanted to be an artist is because of the time that he spent with them or talked to them about, and they excited them. I know your father had that same, same type of following. And, and I look back at it now it can be very aggravating. <laughs> you know, it's not all, it's not a, a, all daisies and roses when you're teaching. I mean, it's hard work and to do it properly, it's hard work and I enjoy it. But at, at times you're like, Hey, this is really taxing, but then you have somebody write you something like that and it, it all goes away. <laughs> yeah, so. um, definitely. And I, I think that's when we talk about um, balance of things and, Similar to what you were saying um, with your father, when my father passed away, I, I knew what a great artist he was and how his artwork was beloved, but it was exactly like you were saying, it, it was the people who still to this day, random people who write me notes through social media and say um, how he influenced them in their path of becoming an artist and and gave them confidence in what they did. And, oh, he was tough, but he allowed me to whatever. So I think when it comes to legacy, um, kindness reigns in certain ways. It's That's really like what's remembered um, so often. So I think students, you know, give that to you because you, you can change a path of someone's life with kindness and encouragement and, you know, and we and all good know information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can't, it's not going to all get well, the yeah. kind. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we, we have critiques. We all have to give critiques and we call them critiques to be critical on it. But I also think everyone has a unique voice. And I do think there is a way to look at someone's work and discuss someone's work without insulting them, without them wanting to turn around and never do it again. Because I think there's such power in being a teacher that you could almost do that to somebody. And 
um, and artists are, we're very sensitive about our work. I mean, our work is like part of our body and our organ. And it's like, you know, we're, we're creating it. We put ourselves out there. I mean, what other career like just puts our, like their things like out there for people to say, ah, oh, not that good. Oh, great. Or, you know, it's like, so I think there is a way of encouraging people to be better in their artwork without cutting them down and making them feel insecure about what they do. You know, be, being an artist is a high stakes game of playing show and tell. And uh, <laughs> you make something which is very personal to you. And in our industry, you got to put it out there. And, you know, it's like convincing people that they have to learn how to do that. I mean, they have to get over that. Uh, it, that again, I, I, I was, I don't know when I, when, when I was having this conversation, it must've been drawing last week. Um, but, you know, to do that, to put yourself out there. Um, oh, and our portfolio reviews that we were doing the other night, I, I said this, it's like, I had to, I, I had to convince myself that number one, that I could do it. It was painful for me to do it. I think maybe more than a lot of people, because I knew there was going to be comparison. I realize the value, you know, you can, you can learn so much faster when you do expose yourself uh, to other artists that know what they're talking about um, and, and, and getting over that, you know, putting your foot in the water, it, it's the first step, you know, and uh, if you can do that, you can really grow. Um, isolating is, is not the best way to grow as an artist. Right. The, these are all um, a column that I was talking about from Microsoft. It was, I did this for a couple of years, every month for their online magazine. And it was ironically just all about relationships. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, I love oh. these. Was yeah, great. all of these were all, that's what so, that was. So I, I remember reading somewhere in the stuff I've been reading about you. And you did a, a, an op-ed page for the New York Times when you were like a teenager. Like really, uh, when, I, when I was fifteen, that was my first assignment. Um, it was a little tiny, little. I mean, it was little. Um, it was this little black and white um, ink drawing um, for the op-ed op page of the New York Times. Yeah, that was my like first assignment. I did like little assignments here and there all throughout college. Sometimes I would ask my professors if I could exchange an assignment for one of the assignments. Um, in the classroom, but I started like working um, pretty young with assignments here and there in the summer times. That's awesome. Um, one of the, I, you know, one of the great advantages of being us <laughs> uh, in our in our industry. I mean, there's there's disadvantages, but one of the really great advantages we understood how it worked. Um, we 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 could see the industry and we could we learned how it worked it, it worked and how to function inside of it. Um, I had a lot more knowledge of that than I did as skill as an artist when I got started. And um, I was always trying to catch up on the skill level, be better uh, to be a better artist. Um, but I understood how to, you know, ma make a career out of it. Um, that yeah, I mean, I, I always ask my student, this is the piece for the New York Times um, magazine Sunday section that I was talking about. This is probably the most important in my own mind and goals of an assignment I ever did because it was my dream to work for them as a kid. And when I created this assignment for them, it was like my goal, you know, I was so happy. This is the one when you, this wasn't the one when you were 15. This, no, no, no. This no, was the New York Times Magazine um, okay. Sunday section. Um, I always wanted to work for them. Like my whole childhood, I wanted to work for the magazine section, the Sunday magazine section. And there was someone, I can't remember his name right now. He did very geometric shapes and he did the column every week and he was on vacation <laughs> and they needed to give the assignment to someone and they actually called me um, to create the assignment. And it was like a dream come true. And, you know, for all illustrators when they're starting and for the women who have young children, um, my son was only a couple 
months old and my dream job being this, I had to work with him on my lap half of the time. <laughs> so I was like, well, my dream finally came here. And my son is like, I was like holding him and like drawing like at the same time. <laughs> so I really love you. I do, but I'm going to get this job done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This was for Bloomberg on like things that happen in the office. <laughs> Yeah, maybe things that shouldn't happen in the office. These are great. Yeah, this was for, um, this was like going to be a new magazine. I can't remember. It was kind of like they were trying out a new magazine. I can't remember um, if it ever went to print or what, but this was something they had asked me to do for inside of it. Fantastic. Thanks. Well, that's fun. Tough topic. Yeah. Uh, this was for Harvard Magazine. Have, this, uh, yeah, this, this piece, actually, this is the first show. You know, I've been curating the Society of Illustrators members exhibit for 11 years now. And this is the when I like started um, curating that show, um, I did this piece for it. They were all little and it was um, kind of like the Talking Heads song, Stop Making Sense. This was Start Making Senses. And it was all the senses, you know, ears, eyes, nose, whatever. And I had everyone do these like little cards. And this was the first member show um, that I curated for the Society of Illustrators. So you were, you be, before you were present, you were on the board for a long period of time, um, Yeah, well, actually, um, I came, I was asked to join the board in 2014, so it would be 10 years right now, but I had actually been curating the members show before I was even on the board. I think that's how it all kind of happened. Um, GBU, what, they had a different chairman of the members show every single year, and GBU um, who you know I adore and I knew for a long time. He asked me to be on the jury. He was the chairman um, that year, and I wanted the show to be stronger. And I I opened up my mouth and voice that you know I had some ideas um, for the show. And uh, Nell Miller, who was the executive director at that point, said, "I'll call you next year." And she did the next year when it was the show. Um, and I was asked to curate and be the chairperson of that show. And I continued actually to, um, ever since then, I just, I've been curating it um, ever since then. So, yeah, so that was like um, around the same time, a little after um, I became on the board, they asked me to join the board. And um, I've been president of the Society of Illustrators since last January. So it's really like exactly a year right now as president. Wow. And They've gotten a, a, I'm just going to say through the grapevine and uh, community wise, there's a lot of good things happening. Uh, there's, a, there's an energy there. Uh, I know why you're, you know, you're going into the city tonight and there's a, there's an energy there that's uh, really been good. The, the organization is great. Um, uh, the happy, they've been having these happy hours um, almost every month now. And they're packed with people. It's just so great. Members, friends. And I, what I think is so great about it is most of the happy hours that we have are not for any reason. Um, it's not an opening um, connected with it, except for tonight. There is an opening connected to it. But it's just for people getting together there for the point of just seeing each other and hanging out. And, you know, what could be better than that? Um, the energy is great there. Um, right now we have um, a new executive director, Arabelle Leopold. She's been there um, for a little more than a year and she's really great. Um, I love partnering with her and um, the staff is amazing um, and it's, it's a great place. Um, well, excellent. Great job. And I think maybe we might talk about a little bit more of that at the end, but the, um, this is you being an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I 
actually started, you know, it's funny. I, I didn't know, ever think of creating murals. And, you know, I'm also on the board of directors, the executive board of a music venue um, up in Connecticut because it started because I just love concerts and music. <laughs> and I had this opportunity um, to join the board there um, after volunteering to help them out with some design things. And um, the artistic director told me that there was an opportunity for me to create a big mural on the side of a hotel, um, this big wall um, in Fairfield, Connecticut. And I went um, with a few friends to look at this and it was daunting. It was big. It wasn't on a flat surface. I had to be in a cherry picker. And I looked up at this huge wall and I'm like, I don't know if I could do this. This is actually the music venue. This is like another um, piece that I did. But um, I didn't think I could handle it. And one of my friends looked at me and he said, this is it. This is actually the, the, my first mural. And my friend said to me, he said, don't be a baby. And I was like, <laughs> all right, I'm not going to be a baby. I'm going to do it. And actually, my son, this is my son and um, one of his closest friends. Um, they were my assistants, drove the cherry picker for me. Um, and I didn't even realize like when you're creating a big mural like this, when you are up close, you only see like what's in your like one frame. So the cherry picker would have to go back and forth. Um, but thanks to their assistance, this was my first mural and I kind of got this like buzz. I was like into it for like a couple of years. I created a lot of murals for people and it was really fun. And there's incredible things that come from that too. And connections I made and um, just, you know, great stories of that. I think I'm kind of, I, I haven't done a mural in a while. Murals are strenuous. I mean, it's like up and down ladders and it's house paint and it's, um, it's really hard work. It's a lot easier to be working on a drawing board, but <laughs> What's really cool, I, I've gotten really into like, you know, community, like big like pieces. And there's something to people driving by and seeing your artwork huge, like driving on the highway and saying, Leslie, I saw your artwork. I knew it was yours as soon as I saw it. There's something really to that. So um, murals are fun as well. <laughs> that's that's terrific. I. I, I was hoping that your friend that convinced you to do it was up on the cherry picker with you. <laughs> he, he wasn't, but he's a great artist. Um, Frank Foster Post. He's a, he's a good friend of mine and um, he, he does his own great work. <laughs> well, this is. Uh, yeah, these are some of my little cards. I think there's a whole series of these. Yeah. And these, you know, I've gone on, you know, some of these little things where I was just sitting in my studio with my thoughts, creating something, these tiny little cards, which are like two and a half inches by three and a half inches have gone to bigger things. I've created merchandise with a lot of them. Um, I've created bigger pieces for people. Um, I've created like homeware with some of them and um yeah i mean one piece that i did crazy enough i made a mug a drinking mug out of one of these little drawings i did just on a whim in my studio and then that got into the hands of dua lipa the musician and then it went viral and i always talk to my students about thinking like you could be doing some little innocent thing in your studio one day, not thinking about anything big. And it's amazing. It can become big um, too. So that was like really fun. Um, this is another column that I did. This was for Louisville magazine. And it's <laughs> like, I worked for them for so many years on this one column and um, Nancy Austin, who was the writer of this column, she creates all kinds of books too on business and, and things. And she would buy almost every single one of my pieces for her um, office. And I, I just worked with her for years and had a collaboration. It's like really amazing. It's great. The uh, uh, I teach a portfolio class with Dale Stefanos and 
Dale's obviously an editorial illustrator and uh, you, you know, talking about like Louisville magazine, uh, where assignments come from. There's so many editorials all over the place. And yeah. he told the student one day uh, to go into, they said they were going to Barnes and Noble and he said, yeah. go to the magazine rack, take a picture and bring it to class. So at class, he said, okay, so you see this rack. He said, everybody wants to work for the, 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 uh, venues that are like at eye height, eye level, because yeah. it's, it's Rolling Stone, it's the New Yorker, it's Time, it's Fortune, it's, uh, you know, it's all the, it's all the big guns right there. He goes, but understand, he goes, go to the bottom rack. He goes, that's where I make my living. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this Matt, I worked for them and I had, I never met them live. Um, I worked for them for years to a point that when my son was born, they sent me like dozens of yellow roses to congratulate me. I mean, you have like these like, you know, relationships with people you work with and things too. So this was like really great. I no longer have this assignment. I mean, the, this it passed by and, you know, in magazines very often, you know, it's on for a while, then someone comes in and they restructure things. But this was really a great, great assignment for so long. Yeah, the art, the artist that normally works from went on vacation. and you <laughs> <laughs> right. That's how it happens, right? Yeah. So hey, um, this is the last slide that I have up. <laughs> And um, what thank I want to ask you, you now, uh, what I, yeah, that's why I, I, I left it up to tell everyone thank you. And I really appreciate you doing this. Before you go, though, uh, we've talked about it a little bit, but I want you to uh, always give somebody the opportunity to promote something. And um, I think I know what you want to promote. And I would like you to just talk about it a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I never have anything like major to promote. I kind of just live my life and my passion kind of is a natural promoting of the things that I do for things. But, you know, being the president of the Society of Illustrators, of course, I love illustration and I love it there. And, and we've been working on as, you know, it was brought up that there's great things going on tonight's happy hour and um, an opening. The annual show is going to be up coming up. And I'll actually, for both openings of the annual shows, I'll be up there speaking and welcoming everybody and thanking everyone for their incredible art and everyone's, you know, incredible support um, of the Society of Illustrators. Um, you know, right now um, we're working, um, just trying to collaborate with other great um, art communities in New York. We have a project that's coming up right now that we're on a jury that we're going to be with um, all these great, you know, Christie's and Artnet and um, the Shed and the MoMA working together. So I think collaboration between art communities is a great thing. I love collaboration. I love collaboration actually with all kinds of people. I think we have a lot to offer and support each other. So, you know, my passion really is, you know, for supporting and for the illustration world and um, being out there to see everyone. And so thanks, John. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, the Society of Illustrators, I mean, it's not like a, you know, fly by night organization <laughs> they've been around since 1901 right. um, and and our uh thankfully uh i think it's nice to mention both our both our fathers are members of uh the, the hall of fame there and it had everything to do with me having a career getting started you know being in those shows being aware and and not just being in the shows but being aware of what was in those shows and how they've organized it they they are today still just as pertinent for a young emerging artist um you need to, whether you're involved on day-to-day -day activity but you need to be paying attention uh because the best of the best work in the in in the industry is seen there every year in their annual shows um well, I think, you know, the Society of Illustrators is a home for illustrators. Um, it's a place where we can all be, where we all do what we do there. And the Society of Illustrators supports all of us. And, you know, often people say to me, you know, what, what's the reason for membership? And I say, you know, as membership, you're, you're supporting the most important illustration community in the world. You know, what would we be without having the annual shows? And all these shows is what represents 
um, illustrators throughout the world. So I find the importance of that. And yeah, I grew up um, going there. I, I met a lot of illustrators when I was very young who were sitting there and having lunch and um, hanging out there. So um, it's a very important organization. Yeah, and it's been around for a long time. <laughs> I thought I, I, that just makes me smile. I just think I remember I was probably six or seven years old the first time I walked through those doors. Um, and well, maybe eight, I don't know. But I remember going in, my father was supposed to be taking care of me that day. And so he would take me in, sit me at the bar, and he would go have lunch with somebody. And yeah. so I would sit and talk to drink uh, too many Coca-Colas and uh, um, eat peanuts and uh, uh, just kind of look around. Um, so I have memories from it for, of my whole life. And, uh, you know, Terry Brown, we mentioned, was the ex-director um, mm -hmm. to ago and was there right about the beginning of my career and through most of my illustration career and uh the involvement was critical uh as an illustrator it's crucial and it still is um they're just as pertinent now uh, just for the information so leslie i thank you for taking yeah. on the chore <laughs> it's not an easy chore um, but, uh, you are definitely a flag bearer for our industry thank and, you. and, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and spending the afternoon with me. And, um, I, I'm just going to remind you, we're doing another one of these on your phone about your yep. phone soon. I'm ready. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, thank, let, you. thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You were awesome.